This episode is sponsored by Free Market Kids. Join the league of families who are transforming family time into unforgettable Bitcoin learning experiences. With our Hoddle Up Bitcoin mining board game, you're not just playing. You're building bridges, creating memories, and unlocking the brilliance of the future one block at a time. Kids can learn something that you don't even realize is possible at a specific age. They hit that milestone way before it's expected. Welcome, folks. This is Bitcoin Homeschoolers, and this is something that we feel is bigger than something bigger than ourselves. It's going to really impact the future generations. Bitcoin is self custody for money, Noster is self custody for speech, and homeschooling is self custody for for education. I, I really do believe that. And we are just honored to have this awesome couple here today that we're going to spend some time and get another point of view. They're both Bitcoiners and homeschoolers. So, Shane and Meredith, welcome. This is awesome. We're really excited to spend uh, spend some time with you guys tonight. Oh, I'm yeah. humbled to be here, Scott uh, and, and Tali. Thank you guys for having us. I mean, being some of your your first guests, even. I mean, what a what a privilege. Thank you guys, and uh, to have Meredith on. We don't we don't get to do shows very often together, so you know this is this is kind of a, a nice mix to to have and. Um, I think the fact that you guys are starting Bitcoin homeschoolers, if anybody's listening and you're into Bitcoin or homeschool or any of this kind of stuff, it's a, it's a great market right now to maybe put something out there and attract, uh, this organization. Yeah. So let me, let me just say for folks, we, so Shane and I have just started to get to know each other with a couple podcasts related to Bitcoin and, and veterans. This is the first time though, that we have both of our respective spouses together and we're all able to to go deep on the homeschooling side of that. And let me just say up front, God bless you guys for doing that. I think anybody who takes this on, this is a, this is a, this is a passion. This is a mission and it's not always easy, but it's worth it. And we're, we're grateful for people like you to, to, uh, that, that do that. If you guys could do a quick introduction, pretend that no one knows who Shane is, for example, and then tell us like what got you into homeschooling kind of lead into the, that subject. Okay. Um, I'm Meredith Hazel, married to Shane. I was a public school teacher for, I want to say it was six years total. Um, then we had a baby and we decided that we wanted to have me stay home. So until he was old enough to need to start doing school, um, you know, I was home with him and then and it was time for him to start going to school and we decided that we were going to homeschool. Um, I'm sorry. I'm like out of breath. right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and for anybody who's listening, like it wasn't just that we were like, oh, let's homeschool economically as a school teacher. It, it, it really didn't make sense. No, um, you know, because Child care alone was ridiculous. Yeah. It, even consider me going back to work before the kids were old enough to be going to school with me. Because in my mind, as a teacher, I was going to go to school, take my kids with me, come home at the end of the day, and we would just be together. Because that's what I saw so many teachers growing up in education doing. Like they just always had their kids with them at school. So once we started homeschooling it, it it just i we used to say we were taking it year by year at least i did i know maybe you weren't <laughs> i was in uh, full full in i was just like this is this is this is happening yeah. and, and and really it was one of those things where it we, i think i think you have to back up a little bit because we had made some decisions like we had downsized our home we had gotten our, our affairs in, in terms of debt and all that kind of stuff like we've gotten all the financial stuff kind of in order we were set. um yeah. so that we could make the adjustment to a, a single family income and that i think that's probably one of the the biggest things that a lot of people really fear is like oh we're going to a single family income and we kind of just looked at each other and was like no we can do this and actually it might allow me to do more at work mm-hmm. um and i think as, as males a lot of times we're not we're not so i don't know in in so useful uh i don't know if that's the word with with infants right it was like with with infants like they There's only so much you can yeah they you really need a mom and 
you know, the, the dad is like that guy that should probably be out. And I'm not, we're fairly traditional, obviously, but it's like you should be able to go out and work extra hard now if she's covering the house. And that's no small feat, right? But it, now that it's in good hands, it's like, all right, dude, you got to you got to perform more. You got to mm-hmm. perform better. And it puts a, a good type of pressure on. And I think that's kind of how we were we started. And golly, it happens fast after that. I mean. I mean, we're, we're about 10 years in now when, when you think about it. Yeah. So, um, well, tell her, and I think want, oh, about sorry, halfway through, I used to, oh, did the audio go out? Or no, that was me. About sorry. halfway through, I, that's when I started, like, if people were asking, like, how long are you homeschooling? I'd be like, uh, till they're done. <laughs> like, I'm not, <laughs> it's, it's no longer, I no longer say, we'll we'll see how each year goes. It's. If something is not working with homeschooling, I've I've just learned I, I need to change how I'm doing it. And if it's with one kid in particular or all three of them, usually it's just an individual thing that happens. But um, I just make adjustments. And if I don't know about you, something like math is uh, taxing for a, a child of mine in particular. I've probably been through four or five different curriculums with him just because. I need to change it up for him every once in a while. Yeah. So Tully, I know you wanted to ask about their initial challenges. So I'm kind of stealing her question. When Mm -hmm. you guys made that decision and you were, you just started, you just started, what was the hardest part about kind of figuring out that next step and and how you were going to actually do this thing? Gosh, I don't know. I think you were, uh, I think the admin side, I remember you kind of struggling you know, well, the, the admin side, like, all right, how do we legally do this in the state? Do, how, how do we find out everything that we need to find out? Because at the end of the day, you don't want everything that you do for your child to come back and haunt you or for the state to have to get involved at any point. Um, the last thing anybody wants is some sort of truancy law being violated yeah. in, in the knock at their door from either child services or the sheriff. And then on the other side of that, it was kind of trying to figure out and find different groups for ideas on mm-hmm. curriculum and the divorcing, the, the mentality of divorcing, I think was probably the, maybe the biggest hurdle she had because, you know, she's, she's a planner by nature and she's really good. I mean, like very good at planning. I, I, I hate that kind of stuff. So it, I appreciate the people that do it and do it well. Um, so to see her kind of go through that evolution, I definitely would say, and there was probably a, a good struggle there for you just watching. Yeah. Um, I think I used to over plan a lot too. Like it, it wasn't necessary. I learned again after a few years that it's just kind of easier to honestly do what you can get accomplished in a day and then just kind of make note of it. Like it's kind of like reverse planning almost where you just kind of record what you did, a couple things down here and there and it, it gets too technical and too busy if you try to plan it out. Yeah. And I think maybe on, on my side, one of the, the biggest hurdles I found was I was, I was working in corporate America I was traveling a lot and I was doing program management and international business development at the time. And it required a lot of travel and it required me to really perform and be away and long hours. I mean, a lot of times, especially and I'm kind of that guy that will go in at like six o'clock in the morning to an office and work till six o'clock at night in an office. Well, when you were doing that, though, you would come home sometimes like three. Like if you went super early. Yeah, three or that four might, That might have been before kids, though. Yeah. But yeah, once it started happening, I think the hardest part for me was still living in that corporate type of lifestyle um, yeah. because we we're the, the plan was to remove ourselves the way we have now into more of a homeschooling, homesteading uh, living kind of more of a, an imbalanced type of, uh, nature. And I was discovering passions at that point that in, in politics and then Bitcoin later. And so to kind of be all over the map and still doing this side of it and making sure that the wheels on the bus stayed on the bus at home, right. It's like that, I think that was probably the hardest part for me, but I think that's any young man that has a family out there. I think that's, what you're going to find is you're going to start to sacrifice what you can sacrifice so that your kids can have a better life and your, your family can have a better life. And it it just, it makes sense. Right. If that's what you value, then you put that ahead of that Mm -hmm. extra vacation or the nicer, whatever car, whatever it is. So actually, so Shane on that, I mean, maybe you can comment on this. We, 
a lot of people will ask initially, like, what kind of curriculum? And it gets into the, the traditional school type of ideas of what you're supposed mm -hmm. to teach. I personally, I really am excited by what homeschooling parents do that is not traditional. I mean, you, I mean, it could be anything from business to ethics to um, fitness. I mean, there's, there's so many more life skills. If the kids are with you when you're figuring out what you're going to cook for dinner and going to the grocery store and like, it's just, it's just different. So I'd love to hear from you guys. What, what kind of things outside the normal traditional curriculum that you would get in a public school, what are some of the things that you guys have that, that you may be one or two that you feel really strong about that you're glad that you've brought into the homeschooling realm? Do you want to tell them what you just thought about having the kids do with you each? I think you said each week you're going to ask them to. Oh yeah. I mean, this, this is just an idea off the top of my head. I was like, uh, we were, you know, we kind of brainstorm stuff at night and we'll have conversations and all that fun stuff. And I was like, I, I really think it may be time for the kids to teach me something once a week. Oh, and wow. that's it. Obviously I come from a background where um, it was learn one, do one, show one, which means you learn one, you learn something, then you do the practical application side of it so that you kind of understand the, the functionality of it and you learn it to the point where now you can teach it. So that's that idea that can push somebody to a certain level of stress. You know, you don't want to overload your kids <laughs> every week with something crazy. <laughs> but, you know, um, for example, like uh, back in the day when we were growing up, my mom and dad were always like, you better find something else to do besides play those stupid video games because you'll never make a living in that. Figure 20, 30, 40 years later now, I don't know how. But um, now there's a, a trillion dollar industry in video games. And had I stuck with that. Been in, billionaires. Yeah, it, I, I would have I known better. So obviously I have children that are interested in all the same stuff I was at the time. But... I also understand that, hey, there is a market for this and there is something to be understood. So as soon as I started telling my oldest, like, look, if, you, if you're going to spend this kind of time on this, you need to figure out how to monetize it. You need to figure out how to make a business out of mm. it. And the next thing I know, he has set up some servers. He's got some bots that are operating in the background. And I'm not a technical guy like that. Like, I don't know any of that kind of stuff. So as he comes along and starts you know, like showing me, Hey dad, you want to talk about discord? And I'm like, no man, like I, I, but I should, I should sit there and I should have those conversations. Right. And I should be like, yeah, you know what? Once a week, teach me something that you're doing. Teach me something that you're thinking about. Teach me something that you've learned that you may not think I know. And I think that's going to be one of the best things about it is kind of the, the challenge. And so that's, that's a little, mm -hmm. you know, a little, uh, outside of, I think the normal world where I don't think, parents want to be taught by their kids um, for anything, but I think it actually stimulates their, their growth. And if you want to take the, the next one. Um, I was just going to say, you know, something as simple as like, I think it was mostly last year when I really got into making bread. Like our daughter can, she, she was eight at the time and she can, she might need a refresher now, but at that point she had done it with me so much that she could literally make the sandwich bread for the week because I was trying not to buy it from the grocery store. So um, if I had to run out and, you know, go run an errand and the bread was rising or on its first rise, I could call her or text her and be like, Hey, will you take care of doing the next rise for the bread and like divide it into the pans? And she knew how to do it and she could handle it. Um, another thing, I just all three in general, we have chickens and they, all do different things for them and with them so that it's not all falling on us. All yeah, the time. there's 38 of them. So it's not like a small number of chickens. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, so our oldest is capable, pretty capable of taking care of cleaning the whole coop out and refreshing the bedding. And he's strong enough now that he can fill the, the feeder, lift a 40, 30 pound bag of yep. feed. Um, and then usually the other two kind of help with putting away the chickens at night or gathering the eggs and, and all that. I mean, that is nothing that would have happened a few years ago because we, one, didn't live in an area that we could even have chickens or consider having chickens. And I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm sure there are kids in public school that own, their families own chickens, but it, it just made it it's like a nice thing that they have learned how to do and, and can do in the future if they so choose to raise chickens. 
Yeah, you hit. Uh, there's so many things going through my head. I mean, you're teaching them responsibility. They are a contributing member of the of the family. They mm -hmm. if they don't do something, there's consequences. If they keep the door open at night and the raccoons get in or something, like <laughs> you know, like, there's some the <laughs> there's some real consequences. We we had chickens, so uh, I, <laughs> we we had problems with dogs and chickens too. Um, <laughs> but I think I think teaching responsibility, having a little bit of stress, not enough to the like, they they need to fail a little bit to learn. And there's a lot of things in there. So who, who teaches about money? Because I'm sure as Bitcoiners, that's, all... that's as that Shane's? Mostly. Yeah, but, but I would say, you know, money is, is I'm somewhat... more the fiat end of it. it well, it's, it's so, the thing is, is it's so nuanced and, and it touches everything. And so there's, there's, a, there's a really cool compliment here. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of the, the economics and the money guy, obviously. And um, what's funny is this kind of started... When I was thinking, hey, listen, as we're being better, becoming better versions of ourselves to support a family, um, one of the things that crossed my mind was like, well, I need to, I need to learn how to make money, make money. I need to learn how to make money work instead of I instead of working for money. Mm -hmm. And when that thought crossed my mind, I started going down the Austrian rabbit hole. Uh, this was probably. I don't know, 2011, 2012 sometime. Uh, it was, you know, somewhere around the, the Ron Paul revolution. And as I began to learn more and more and more, I, I kind of just got to the point where I understood that the people who knew money, those guys were never really broke. There were some guys obviously took some bad risk and, and made some bad decisions, but the, those guys, you know, kind of got washed out. And so to, to have that background and then to have children that were actually interested in this whole process because of what I was doing politically at the time and mm -hmm. and then homeschooling and then the the drives that we would take our kids on in terms of to practice for jujitsu. So we would have these conversations and it turned out that the kids were actually very interested in these kind of things, especially my oldest uh Jackson. So he was he was one of those kids that would hear something, we we discuss it and then he'd ask a follow up question, which was actually really easy to start teaching and um, on the, on the other side of this now, all three kids have a business. And so this is kind of the compliment yeah. I was talking about is but as, as they, they've grown and now they've all started their own businesses. Um, the, the understanding of not only money, but investing it and reinvesting it into the company that they're running so that they are trying to grow a business and then making the money work for them in Bitcoin. That's, that's one of those things that we've, we've really kind of instilled and now to the point where like kids are coming up handing us wads of cash and going all right let's write this down in our notebook of how many sats you owe me when <laughs> it's time for me to come back and get this kind of stuff so it the money aspect is uh is 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 very upfront and it's really interesting to see that the kids have figured out that if you provide something to the market um that provides value they're going to they're give you value back money, yeah. and make money. And that's when you've got a, a nine-year-old who can go out and make over $100 an hour selling bead bracelets. <laughs> it's it's one of those Fantastic. proof of work things. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, it's exciting to be able to watch the kids learn, right? There's something like that. And I know that I, mean, I want to ask you guys, like, what are your biggest surprises are? But like, for me, one of the surprises was just how much kids can absorb. And if you don't hold them back with any preconceived notions. They can learn anything and learn it way earlier, right? They'll figure out the money, the chicken, the, the, the whatever. But um, from your perspective, what was like, what's been like a, something that was very surprising, something you did not expect when you started homeschooling? Um, I mean, you just said about, you know, what kids can learn something that you don't even realize is possible at a specific age or a certain age, like, they hit that milestone way before it's expected. I would say Sawyer, our daughter, it she she's she's the smart one. She's she retains so much and like she'll be, you know, I'll be drilling my oldest about some math problem that he's just it's not clicking and she's sitting across the table not looking at the numbers in front of her. He's sitting there trying to figure out a basic, you know, division fact. And she's, she's just looking at me like, can I say it? Can I say it? Can I say it? And he gets so mad at her, but she knows it. She's, she's honestly a full year ahead in math, probably even more if I really got down to it. Um, 
she's she's a little math whiz for sure. Um, what would surprise you? Surprising, I I think more or less what the culmination of this has been so far um, is is the most surprising. I think when I, I talk about this quite a bit, and I think we talked about it on the panel together, is this this understanding that I think John Taylor Gatto put it very very succinctly is genius is actually a um, extraordinarily common thing. The problem is, is the the system of school that we have that says sit down, submit to the, the culture. Don't think out. Don't just regurgitate. Get good grades. Get a job. Go to college and pay taxes and all that stuff for the rest of your life, right? So, and that's the culmination of the antithesis of this is trying to to create well functioning human beings that have explored their passions and in having the time dedicated to exploring those passions has really found a niche in the world and that niche because of the time and the passion and the work that prov that provides a, a genius level of understanding you're you're much more likely to get to that 10,000 hours of masterful level of whatever it is if you're allowed to just absolutely devour whatever information you want that is your passion and so to see these kids be able to not only do that, but to to be able to now that they're coming into teenage years, get a little extra rest at, in, instead of waking up at like six or seven a.m. to rush out the door and be force fed gobbledygook by the state for how many hours plus homework is like, no, I'd actually I think that what's healthier is letting them sleep in a little bit, um, take care of their chores in the beginning of the day, knock out what they need in terms of school. And then turning them loose to to go down those paths that they choose so that at some point they are teaching us things. They are running those things. And they, you start to see these human beings develop much earlier. They can communicate with all all sorts of yes. all ages, which is, is a, the common place in society instead of being in these age-restricted groups with the lowest common denominator. Um, and just seeing these these amazing personalities develop out of those things because they have freedom and, and that that piece that you talk about is taking self custody of education those kids as soon as they can read and write and do some simple math Basic, yeah. yeah with the, the power of these things that are monitored what a education is super cheap it's it's the indoctrination that's expensive and so this mm. this has gotten to the point where I, I'm just I'm tickled to death at who these kids are becoming, and as a parent, you not only want to be proud, but you want them to be ready as as young adults when it's time for them to launch. And so, I think that's probably what I'm most excited about is like this contribution to society through through our kids. Is like, all right, yeah. here here's putting how out, we did putting it. Putting out three pretty good what, what, contributions. That's what we here. think so far, anyway. <laughs> not to toot our own horns. But. Yeah. So when you guys started, was that one of the motivators was to avoid the conformity like or was that something that you learned later you <laughs> I, that wasn't even on my brain waves like i i i've, I've got a, a, a few books behind me back here <laughs> um my, i think my most influ influential person that i ever read was john taylor gatto he was the one that kind of broke the spell and he did it in a way when I was overseas, I had just come off the battlefield in Fallujah in November of 04, and I got this book on my bed called The Underground History of American Education, and I was just like, oh, Why do I want to read this oh my God. I, I read it, and it was all about 19, or 1700s Prussia and creating a monoculture to go off and go turn knobs and push buttons, basically homogenous culture, and if they needed to go to war, this this indoctrinated patriotism to go and invade other lands and take blood. Mm -hmm. I was already there overseas doing that, and yeah. I was just like, "Oh wow!" Like, so yeah. I mean, that's that was what kind of woke me up. And so having John Taylor Gatto as my, I don't know, the guy that that kind of did this for me was one of those things where I was like, "Yeah, I don't think I can. I don't think in good conscience I can have my kids go through the same process." Yeah. So Meredith, what was it for you then? If it wasn't avoiding the nonconformity or whatever you want to call that, that whole, that whole piece. What was it for you? I just didn't feel like I, I couldn't imagine sending our oldest at the time, like putting him on a school bus and like, he's so little. And I mean, he wasn't little our kids are pretty tall children, but I just, 
the thought of him going somewhere where I could do everything he would be doing at school. It's like, I, I got this. I can do this. And initially, I don't know how it is in your area. You know, a lot of the preschools and the pre-K classes are offered at like local churches and stuff. And I was like, oh, what's the harm? <laughs> we can just send him. Do you remember this? Send him to a little preschool. He'll have fun. He'll do arts and crafts and come home and tell us stories. <laughs> but nope, we kept him with us. And yeah, for me, it was more, I just, I couldn't imagine not having him home with me. Yeah, I wish that people like because we're doing audio only can see how, how big your smile is when you're like <laughs> talking about like this. Because I totally, I mean, well, if you, if you need to let you jump in here, sweetie. Maybe you can comment on why you know the, just briefly why you wanted to spend time with the kids. Um, <clears throat> originally, like you, <clears throat> I was going to um, go back to work, and we actually had a nanny ready to go. And I was going to stay home for six months and then hand the baby over to her. And I was going to go back to work. And I was holding the baby in my arms after we got home from the hospital. And I thought, you know, if I went back to work, I won't ever see her. I'll leave the house before she wakes up. I'll come home after she goes to bed. And cause I was, I was going to go into investment banking and I was like, she's going to grow up not knowing who I am and I'm not going to know who she is. So we decided to stay home and that what you mentioned uh, about being a school teacher, having a background, that was the thing that I, that scared me the most because I don't have a teaching background. And I assumed that in order for you to homeschool, you needed to have a uh, school teacher background. <laughs> so that was one of the first things I had to get over. But I think in terms of uh, young moms who are listening to this podcast, something that, that is sort of a day-to-day -day challenge that I, I would like for you to talk about is because your kids are close in age and you started when you were first was preschool age. It sounds like at the time you would have had either a one year old or a newborn and you were pregnant. So how do you balance that for the new moms out there? Um, so honestly, when I first started with our oldest, it was like the easiest time because we did have a newborn. I, I guess she was newborn through that. I would assume. So, yeah. So Jack, yeah, we had okay, Jackson, two years apart, who's two years older than his brother Henry, mm -hmm. who's barely thirteen months, fourteen months. Yeah, the last two are super close. Older. Um, but yeah, that was honestly the easiest time period because the baby was still sleeping like two, sometimes three naps a day. Usually, I could get the youngest and um, the middle our middle guy to, to nap at least once at the same time. And that's when we did our, you know, our, our real school. And, um, it, it was, it's fast. It was really fast. It was maybe it, sometimes it was two hours. Sometimes it was as little as an hour, but he was like three, four years old. Like you don't need to do much during that time. And, and at that time it wasn't, you know, we didn't have, I didn't have a curriculum. I wasn't doing, I was reading with him. We were reading, we were learning sounds. We were uh, learning colors and numbers and, you know, simple at math, adding, subtracting with little blocks or counters or cars. Like it was just more intentional during that time when the younger two were sleeping. And after that, we, we just, it, it was playing all day long. We just, played and ate snacks and they drank milk all the time <laughs> and, and you black all that stuff out eventually. like you just you get through i don't know the first six years and you're like oh what, what, what happened, happened? <laughs> the first the first time that it was challenging was honestly when when our second started needing to do like when he was like of kindergarten age because at that point jackson was two years older so i was doing second grade work with him so that's a little more serious I thought so at the time now looking back no it wasn't <laughs> was second grade that serious for our younger two no um but it, initially it, it timing those naps when their siblings are babies and still napping like that's when you do school and that's when you get the you know the real I don't want to say serious but concentrated like math reading get it done while they're other siblings are asleep and then the rest of the day read stories we would go to the library story time we 
would go on field trips with other families to local like farms or apple orchards, pumpkin farms, do all that kind of stuff. I did a lot more of that stuff when they were younger. I mean, you guys you, you guys even had mops. Uh, oh, that's right. I went to mothers of preschoolers. It's pretty common in a lot of areas. It's, I think, a nationwide thing. So we did mops for three or four years. And I made, I honestly have a friend that we still um, go do, you know, little field trips with and all our kids are the same age. So it's nice for them to see each other every once in a while because we don't live close to them anymore. Lots of snacks, lots of diaper bags, lots of just hanging out with your kids and yeah. and try and, and yeah and doing the normal stuff. You know, <laughs> it's like it's it's Sesame Street only in real life. And if you can make it fun, then they're 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 gonna they're gonna want to learn. Right. I mean, and this was back when I was very fixated on our school time looking like school too. So had it been Meredith of today back then. We probably would have been a lot more laid back. We would have been incorporating a lot more chores, I think, <laughs> back then. Easy, easy little kid chores that I should have made them do, but didn't. But yeah, now I, they do. I think. I think um, one of the things that new, new potential homeschoolers might be looking at is just they feel like they have to be so structured. And so they're trying to, like what you're saying, they're thinking traditional, they're thinking you're sitting at a desk, you're forcing your child, holding a pen, and all that stuff, and you have two little ones running around, right? Um, but what I realized really quickly was we can get a whole lot more done in a lot shorter period than schools can. So if you totally. think about preschools, you're dropping them off for three hours, their actual learning time may be 15 minutes. So if we can knock it out in 15 minutes, the rest of the time they just play, like you're saying, they're living the real life and they're interacting. So I, I think that's uh, something that we we should share with new moms to reassure them that it's okay. Kind of like right. what you're saying, like Hard. now, yeah, when you're looking back, it's like we don't need to take it that seriously, especially at that age anyway. Yeah, that was really hard for me to get over coming from an entire life, either being in public education or teaching in public education. Like I thought the fact that it just took us 10 minutes to do an addition lesson like that probably isn't okay and it should be longer i feel like sometimes you would come out if when you were working at home you'd be like why aren't you guys doing anything <laughs> i'm like well we're done like and the, you know the kids are playing or whatever and i think i think sometimes initially you were like why aren't you guys doing more work the principal yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I just, I, that's kind of the role because obviously I work from home, and so the the, the school room and the home are never that far apart. So you know you're always checking in a lot of fun like, stuff. But to to the young mothers and fathers that are out there that uh, are are thinking about doing this, that are doing this, um, I, for you guys, I don't know, you, even you, I don't know what age you kind of figured out that your mom and dad didn't have any clue as to what the hell they were doing with you when they were you, you were growing up. Just like you don't have any instruction manual on how to do this. Mm -hmm. Like this is. This is trial by fire kind of stuff. I know they write books and all that kind of stuff as other people. However, like your your situation is unique. There's a lot of nuance in all of these things. And as long as you don't give up and you fail fast and you learn from your mistakes, that that's that's the whole point to this entire thing that we're doing in terms of life. So yeah, don't be intimidated like, oh, I don't know how to do this. You'll figure it out. You really will. Yeah, get some bumps and bruises along the way and that's how you, and that's how you learn. You, I think you're also I, teaching them time preference. Like you're saying, yeah. the most important thing is, did you understand this lesson or not? Do we accomplish that? Not can you sit still in a chair for forty five minutes, or I'm going to give you a drug and give you a, a label of some kind, uh, right? right. Um, kids are absorbing that framework of how you are approaching things. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think it's there's a lot of really cool things there. I, I there is something I want to challenge you a little bit on, Shane. That you mentioned before <laughs> reading books <laughs> no no we we have thousands and thousands of books in our house it, I, I mean this is like a audible. tiny little fraction of i mean anyway but there there's a um at the trend in the homeschooling community and we've been in it longer than you um by about 10 years i think and so i'm i'm seeing it everywhere and we've moved across multiple states and all different groups, but the trend is always there. We're teaching kids how to start a business, run a business. We're, we're teaching them money in that really practical way. Mm -hmm. I think my challenge it to the, that mentality is we, it's almost like 
you, okay, growing up, I'm Chinese. We had one of five occupations to choose from. You can either be a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, a computer scientist, or something else, um, probably, probably business. And outside of that, you were not allowed to pursue anything else professionally, right? And so if we're, as Bitcoiners, on the one hand, we're saying Bitcoin is simple, simplifying things. The reason that the fiat system is forcing us to look at money and earning money and that whole process of um, uh, being able to like earn a living that is at least comfortable or a value for value kind of proposition type thing. We're trying to teach that to our kids, but at the same time, I feel like we're walking a really, really thin line to balance that. You know, maybe maybe somebody's child really just wants to to be an astrophysicist and all he wants to do is calculate math and he doesn't care about generating some type of value in exchange for money right now at elementary school age. And, but when we are talking about it and talking about it with them and we do the same, we do the same thing to our kids, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of families do the same thing, but it's almost like we're forcing them to continually focus their money on gener I mean, their eyes and their mind on generating income by providing value for in exchange for compensation. And isn't that what we're trying to get away from with the Bitcoin standard, which is you can take your eye off of that because Bitcoin makes it simpler because our, we're not trying to fight this inflationary so, pressure. So and, you're, not, you're not trying to conform all your kids into one thing. Yeah, you have I mean, to, I'm one not career. sure if I'm explaining it right. You know, like I don't think all people should be business people personally because there are people who should be okay, scientists well, or artists or yeah okay anyway yeah no it, it, great question great question um i think one of the biggest things that i always see in in bitcoin is proof of work um and proof of work is one of those things where um the it's it's an understanding that there is a value that you're going to have to provide to society somehow and that's and that's up to the passion um just because our kids uh can put out a, a decent product and they like doing it it doesn't mean that that's for all of them forever it's a season and so in in a season it's it's almost like a, a course so they can they can do this they can either excel at it or drop it for whatever else that they're going to do right. but at some point they do have to have skin in the game and, and skin in the game in a bitcoin society is the name of it because what we obviously as bitcoin maximalists what we don't want are rent seekers like what we're trying to do is cut the rent seekers out of our lives so if they're not providing value and it's and and they don't really have skin in the game I, I hate to say it but you know, it's going to be obviously awfully hard to eat at some point these these lucky kids that do get into bitcoin early and inherit it now this is going to be an interesting thing i think was as kids that have provided maybe a couple thousand dollars into bitcoin by the time they were like 10 11 12 years old and by the time they're 22 and they've gone to through three having events they might be able to do whatever they want. They might be they might yeah. be those guys that see talent, see passion, and now are the people that can deploy those resources into philanthropy. Like and so, like it, it is a curious world in this changing paradigm. And I think that's maybe the most important thing for people to understand is we're on a gradient now, right? Like we're we're on a fiat standard right now for the most part, but we're we're quickly moving as of today it's um, towards more of a, a Bitcoin standard. So to to say at any point where it's right or wrong, I think it's like where are you at on the continuum? And and how how are you operating? Are you are you operating in a, a naive Bukele uh, El Salvador uh, Bitcoin continuum down there if you are you're probably way further ahead if you're not and you're still here in the u.s in this fiat standard then maybe you're going to have to make some adjustments maybe you're going to have to create some community around you and i think a lot of that's going to kind of determine um your path your passion uh and, and and how you're going to to make not only ends meet but how to really fulfill that that calling that you have that you were in, innately uh given by the universe or god or whatever higher power you subscribe to the reason I mention it is because um, we have four kids and all through growing up, every time we see them demonstrate that they're good at something, immediately Scott's giving them ideas to monetize. Yeah. And we've gotten to... <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So this, this question is, is also internal. 
Just so you know, yeah. like this is. And not we've a- gotten to the point where um, our daughters, they we talk all the time, and they're in college. And one of them, I was giving her an idea because she's really good in meditation and yoga and stuff like that. I'm like, why don't you start your own channel and then you can monetize and you can build up a following? She goes, Mom, I really don't want to turn every single one of my passion into a job. Yeah. Be- but that's what we're always talking about, you know. So. I'm split on this. I mean, I understand you don't want to focus your kids, but on the other hand, like I, I think that there are a lot of people out there who are trying to gear their kids to become a rent seeker, like to to be to be a better rent seeker. And I think the public schools now you're trying to conform to how to be a better rent seeker at the end, as opposed to a, a young adult that has critical thinking skills and can challenge. Um, so I mean, exposing yeah, to I, that. I, I mean, that's a I guess I don't do it for everything there. And, and I, I definitely agree. You like, encourage it when it's appropriate. Uh, yeah. It, but there, there are some things, you know, I guess maybe I have said that with video games, like, listen, there's a, there's a, I think in the back of my head subconsciously is like, look, if this is what you're going to do, there's a giant market for it, figure out your piece of it and, and maybe grow that. But there you're, you're exactly right. Talia is, is when, when you look at this, this passion and like soulful stuff that, doesn't necessarily need to be marketed. Mm -hmm. Um, I I see it in my own life, whether it's spending time in the outdoors, mostly spending time in the outdoors, honestly, or with your kids, right? Like a lot of people will monetize their kids in terms of social media and everything. Yeah, all all that kind of stuff. And like, I think maybe that's a stretch, like that's not for us, but um, yeah, the, the ability to just have a hobby and enjoy the heck out of your hobby and be fulfilled by it and find great meaning in it and mastery and really maybe that's just your thing mm-hmm. and nobody else has to share that or make money on it. I, yeah, honestly, I, I think it's a, it's an amazing thing. And, you know, for me, like I, I love woodworking. I love doing all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I monetized it, I kind of, I burned out. You lost the time to do it too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I will say too, like, as far as college goes, we went, we both went to college. We both went through the public school system before college. Um, our kids here and there will ask like, do I need to go to college or how do you answer that? How do you... Um, no, a hundred percent. No. <laughs> I mean, it, it depends. I, it does. I, do I want you to go to college just to figure out life? Probably not. It's an um, expensive proposition don't. these days. Um, but if you become really passionate about, I could see Sawyer, she's mentioned a couple times in the past, wanting to be a doctor of some sort. Like, if that's your thing and you want to go become a pediatrician and advocate for kids and take care of kids, then... Who are we to yeah, I mean, or? there there are certain things like if you're going to be an Law. engineer, if you're going to be a lawyer, if you're going to be a doctor, you know, things things of those nature, right? Like if where, I'm being honest, if you want to be a teacher, I really don't think it's necessary. There you I, go. I don't, <laughs> but I'm I'm sure it could help some people who maybe it, aren't quite as passionate about teaching others. On the economic front, for anybody that's wondering, is if you think your 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 kids or you should go to college. Find the value proposition, right? In it, right? Is, is is the job that you can get coming out of school going to be profitable enough to where you can pay for the debt that you're probably going to incur unless you're working a full-time job and maybe not taking a full load like I did? Scholarships. Um, that's that's your value proposition. Is the, Does it make economic sense? If it doesn't make economic sense, then you definitely should not go mm-hmm. to college. We have dual enrollment um, opportunities in in Georgia. So I think it's once they hit about 15 years old, they can apply at certain colleges. And we have a few pretty close to us. Good technical school. And it's, there's a, a, you know, huge list of what they can get. And in Georgia, it's free. So I'm really going to encourage that for the kids to test the waters (laughs) before they decide to commit to going to a university of any kind. Yeah, there's a ton of resources. I agree with both of what you're saying. For for listeners who haven't yet started their journey or maybe their kids are really young, the other thing I would just mention is notice that none of us are talking about any concern about getting into school if you wanted to, right? Oh, just yeah. because you homeschool doesn't mean that you are somehow cut off from that route if that's actually what you want to pursue or your, your child wants to pursue. That wasn't even a, that's not a, 
a concern that if you're worried about that as you're starting your homeschooling journey, it's more of what, what's right for your kid, which How is the right that... question to ask. Kids. Say that again. How did that process go for your kids that chose to go to, to college? Uh, oh, here goes. Okay, so that was during <laughs> COVID. So all, oh, four, all four of my kids, actually, they graduated about the same time. My oldest graduated right at the beginning of COVID, so everything was shut down. So she took a year off. So the following year, we did school applications for four kids at the same time. <laughs> and it, it was painful. And all four of them did go to school. Um, Can I say something real quick? So Meredith, just so you know, so we, our kids, we have a real tight shot group. So all four kids, like within five years. And then when Tali was teaching, she didn't hold any of them back. So if our youngest happened to be in the same room with our oldest, like they just got off the same thing. It's like she was just yeah. teaching them. And, That's what and we're this, end up like. yeah. So, yeah. so what it led to was a situation where the youngest was ready to graduate at the high school level really early because Tali just let him go along with all the other classes with the with the others. So the reason we were in that situation was first of all, their ages were close together. And then Tali's method of saying, you're you know, you guys are all in this, we're gonna go do X subject or X activity. So anyway, sorry. No, that's fine. So so they all got in and they all did do college for at least one year before my two boys decided to drop out. And we had a conversation uh, with our oldest one, our oldest boy, and he said, why are you letting me, why are you giving me the option to drop out? Because we both also went through the whole public school system and brand name colleges, brand name graduate schools and stuff. And so he was like, why are you letting me drop out now? And I said, but because you've gone for a year, you, you've seen what it's like, and you have gathered data. And if we have new data, and we don't reevaluate our decision, then that's just really stupid on our part. So they went out, they gathered data. He did not like what he saw. He didn't think it was worth the money and the time that we were investing. So he said, I'm dropping out. I said, well, that's fine. You better have a plan. And he does. You know, he's engaged. He's working a good job. They're planning, he and his fiance, they're planning out their life out. So our two girls decided to go back because they wanted that social exposure. They understand they don't go to school for the academic component because the academic component is easy. You can get that for free on the internet. You know, you can get it for free all different places, but they wanted to be in that environment because they grew up in the homeschooling community and they wanted to have that experience before they enter adulthood. But that, that was their choice. We evaluated after the first year. They decided to go back with the understanding of their pros and cons of the debt and the job placement opportunities, things like that. Um, but I do want to address one thing that you mentioned um, when our four kids were, were growing up, that they graduated around the same time. So it, it goes back to our discussion earlier in our podcast about like sort of the balance between giving them free time and teaching them self-discipline. I think Shane mentioned that having giving the kids free big blocks of free time so they can pursue their passion is so important because they don't get that in either public school or private school, right? So if you look at our oldest kid and our youngest kid, the oldest kid was very structured, very, very structured up until she left college because I had all my attention on her. Well, when the youngest one, he was 12 and he graduated school, I didn't feel right to continue to overstructure him because I, if I'm going to graduate him from high school, I need to place some trust on him. But if you look at the two of them, I hope they're not listening, but if you look at the two of them, <laughs> you're good. In terms of self discipline, it's very interesting that they both have this incredible level of self discipline, but in different areas. So Caden has tremendous freedom to explore whatever he wants to do. He's very, very good technically in, on the computer, very independent. And he is extremely self-disciplined when he chooses to believe in the value of the task. Mm -hmm. And then he is like military level discipline, right? Brianna is disciplined across the board because she believes that that's what she should do. And if you look at their energy expenditure in being disciplined in what they're doing. Caden reserves a lot of it 
for his own expression, and then he'll use it when it's necessary, whereas Brianna uses most of her energy trying to do the right thing. Mm. So that's such a fine line, you know, which way do you go, right? Do you, do you, do you push on the self-discipline or do you push on the freedom to self-express? Where are you guys on this? Like where, I mean, what's, what's the next step for you guys? Cause you guys are, I mean, the kids are a little bit younger than where we're at. What are you guys thinking about? Um, I would say that our youngest has a lot more self-discipline. <laughs> I, I, I am trying to work this year, especially with the oldest on the self-discipline aspect of, of school. And it's, it's school. It's not other things. I don't think it's, it's schoolwork. And I don't, I don't want to require school tasks of him, but I was, I was telling you the other day, like he does need to know how to do some basic things. He should be able to write an, an essay and explain, I don't care what the topic is, explain something to me, tell me something, tell me your beliefs about something, write, write me, you know, your opinion. Um, they do need to have basic math skills. I feel like he's still at the level of needing some more basic math skills. Um, the, so for me, self-discipline is maybe even a, a bigger focus than just trying to cover curriculum. Like I want, mm them to be able to be like, okay, what do I need to accomplish today? I'm going to get that done first, all of it, and then I can do what I want and, and you know, explore my self-expression for the rest of the day. What would you say? I think this is, this is I think, really the value of homeschool um, <clears throat> because you you so intimately know each and every one of these kids like their their personalities their hopes their dreams their fears all of these things and because it's nuanced and i i got to learn this firsthand growing up with a left-handed brother and a very right-handed father right like the very right-handed irish father was like this is the way, is the way. it is it's done and when the left-handed younger brother would say look at the way i did the same thing and it would just get absolutely berated and rejected. I saw that, and I I, I got to kind of sit there and take a be a, a judge, right? Of, hey, Dad, actually, he did this, and not only did he do it, he actually did it in a more efficient way than you did, and he came about it from a completely different way. And so to to see that, and to also have a left handed child. It's 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 kind of been a blessing to see this determination where some people would see a, a left-handed child drawing and, and using technology and making designs and scripts like as as maybe a waste of time. And I see it as marketing. I see it as promotion. I see it as some of the most important things that all successful businesses need. Um, with, with Sawyer, there's our, our youngest girl that she mentioned. She's, I think like your oldest girl and she's just very, very structured, very dedicated. She knows what she needs to do. She does it very well. And she just, she likes a checklist, but she, she also likes that affirmation that like, I, I know if I do these things that I'm going to get praise. Mm -hmm. And then there's your oldest and being the oldest child, I also see, like I have to learn my own way and I'm probably going to be that stubborn hard head that's going to make more mistakes. I'm going to make this mistakes faster. I'm probably going to make bigger mistakes. But at the end of the day, having the rope to do that, having having that leash that is like, hey, man, you, you get to hang yourself with this or, you know, this is you know, going to be your greatest asset and. So when I see you guys struggle and all that kind of things with math or whatever, I also know that I was that way and what I've been able to accomplish given the fact that I am stubborn and extremely goal oriented mm -hmm. and have a, have something in my mind that I'm like, I can go do this. And so I think it's, I think that's the greatest thing about homeschool is you just, you get to really understand the passion, the understanding of the dreams and the fears of your kids. And mm -hmm. you can help them basically with a rudder more or less rather than that guiding manipulative hand. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's kind of the way I see it is you might not see it yet, but you know, in the years to come, like those kids are going to 
they're going to figure it out. And because you've provided such a loving and endearing environment for them, most of the time it's going to make you proud. Yeah. And you're letting them fail too. I mean, you're encouraging them to, to figure it out. That's really cool. So just to kind of start to kind of bring it home. Um, oh, wait, well, I, I, okay, go for thing. it. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, so earlier when you were talking about this new thing that you're doing with your kids, asking them to teach you something that they know, I absolutely love that idea. And this is something that I didn't understand when the kids were younger and I was a new teacher. I didn't understand the value of allowing your child to teach what he or she knows. I thought, because the, the, how I learned it, they were young and we brought them to a karate school and the karate teacher was always talking about how the older kids should teach the younger kids, right? And my, my oldest one at the time, how old was she, like seven or something? And I was like, no, 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 she can't teach. She needs to be here to learn. You need to be teaching her. And the teach, their sensei was, was adamant. She was like, no, she will learn by teaching others. And I didn't understand that. But I have since, of course, changed my mind because I see so much value in me trying to teach them. I feel like I had a whole new education for myself when I was homeschooling them. So for the new parents out there, even if your child is very young, like let's say your child is three years old and he has a two year old sister, right? Like let him show her how to do something. It boosts his confidence. It allows him to understand what he actually knows and he'll feel really capable. And that's more important, really, than the ABCs. Yeah, a lot there. That's, that sense of accomplishment is that that's huge. You know, it's in the earlier you can get a sense of accomplishment and and he prays on that accomplishment and he feels or she feels like, wow, you know, I'm actually contributing to our family or this world or this sense of like being. You know that 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 sense of being in terms of creating a family. I, that that is, I mean, that's a critical piece to to really you know fostering something that's that's bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh I man, I love this stuff. All right. So one of the things that I really wanted to ask you guys, I had this image of some of the people who might be listening to the show, and in my head, I'm thinking of a younger couple. Maybe they have a newborn or a toddler, or maybe they're just thinking about having a family. And so with with them in mind what would you for each of you what would be like a piece of advice it could be anything from what we were just talking about or it can be books or whatever but just what would be something that you would say you know here's something to really think about or take home um do you have something in i'd say okay, go ahead trust yourself and 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 really if i if i was talking to myself 12 years ago on on this matter is I would say, hey man, you're like you've done harder things. You've you've you've, and the thing is, is like just getting to the point where you're a father. I you've done some. I hope you've done some hard things. Marriage is one of those things that you got to work at. School, you know, especially if you didn't like school, was one of those things you had to work at. Possibly having a job that you just you know had to eat a pile of poo at. That wasn't an easy thing to do, you know. So it's it's like, look, kids are actually. A great blessing and they're a great reward and the more time that you sink into them the better you're going to feel about the entire situation so trust yourself trust that you like you and your partner are made to do this i mean literally this is what the species is about have kids be a family raise them to to go out and be able to contribute to society and continue to the species and so you're innately programmed with this intelligence to be able to do this kind of thing and to do it well. And to, this old fashioned idea that a, 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 a wife's place isn't as the homemaker and it's discounted as some sort of, I don't know, less than, less than rather than this is what makes everything else work. Like trust that this is natural trust that you are programmed to do this kind of thing, trust that you will fail along the way and trust that you can get back up from it. Because at the end of the day, I don't know, looking back now, 12 years, if I, if I would have known where I would be now, because we made that life decision 
to homeschool to have her be the homemaker and for me to go out and get after it and put all of that stubbornness and energy into not failing or I should say failing fast and learning from those things I would be like I would be like dude it gets way better it gets so much better your relationship with your wife is going to be better your relationship with your family is going to be better your relationship with your community is going to be better you're going to be able to contribute more and more and more not only to your family but you're going to be able to do these kind of things where you can contribute to other people's families young couples who are nervous about this kind of thing taking the edge off like this is the opportunity that you have before you to do something so so much bigger than yourself that it is a not only a, a blessing but it, I think it is a calling for young men especially and I'd be remiss if I didn't say women if if you're if you're not considering being a stay at home mom this might be your greatest calling on this planet. Mm-hmm. You're not wasting your life by doing it. Yeah. By oh God, no! <laughs> Quite yeah. the opposite. So I would say two things, and I'm not going to speak as eloquently as Shane does, but I think my first is just to not be afraid to follow your own path. Um, we obviously, we, we've we mentioned we, we both are products of public school and going to college, and he even joined the Marine Corps. We obviously followed paths that are pretty cookie cutter for the first part of our life, and now... I think more and more there are people that are choosing a path similar to ours, but we still are pretty much beaten to our own drum and following our own path. And many people and many friends that we have maintained in our life don't homeschool their kids. Um, Many of our family members don't homeschool their kids. We're, we are the outsiders, I would say. But we also, they also know that there's something special. Yeah. And that's. And they'll all, all everybody in our life will, be, I think, would be the first to admit that, that our kids are unique, but not a, in a weird homeschool kind of way. We're not those weird homeschoolers. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, I, I don't want to sound braggy, but they're special. They, they know how to interact with others. They know how to show empathy and they, they're not afraid to be friendly with, you know, a new person they come across and follow your own path. Second thing I would say is this is very teachery of me and may, I would say more teachery than mothery, but and those are not words. I'm sorry. You know, that drives you nuts. <laughs> um, read to your kids every day. I still, every day, and there are days when we don't technically do school, but every day I, I am still reading aloud to my kids. Um, there was a time when they all would have headlamps and would be reading in bed. I don't know that it happens quite as much as it used to, but even if you're having a rough homeschool day and just nothing is going right, that math lesson's not going right, no one's listening, no one's doing it, they're, they're fighting, they're crying, grab a book and just start reading to your kids. And nine times out of 10, it'll just reset the day and everything will be better. Reading is important. Love it. Love it. Teach. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Can I add one more thing? You can get as many as you want. Because go yeah. ahead. And... I, I think... <laughs> I think this is really important for those young guys to have fun with your kids um, and, and learn patience as fast as possible. If you can, if you can have fun and make time, um, those two things, like it, it goes so fast. And before you know it, like they're as tall as you are. And sometimes they are picking other things rather than hanging out with you and like, right. Like, and so, if if you do those things, if you have fun and you, you're approachable and you can and do all these things, like those kids are going to want to be around you, um, and they're going to have, I think, those memories that hopefully they instill in the, in their next generation as well. Yeah, those life experiences, especially. I mean, the I don't know what the statistics are, but once you're past eighteen, the, the number of minutes you're going to spend with your parents is like compared to how many while you were growing up, and so. Yeah, just treasure every one of those experiences that you can get. Yeah. So this is I, awesome. I, I could see like wanting to just come back to you guys with other 
questions. Uh, are you guys comfortable with letting people reach out to you if there's other Bitcoin homeschoolers that wanted to? And if you are, then let us know um, how they could reach you. Um, you can always reach me, uh, Shane, at shanehazel.com. Or um, I guess you can probably just reach out to me and yeah, then, then that I'll, might be easier. I'll just, just, I'll, just yeah, I'll just make out uh, make He'll the connection. Send it to me. Um, and then uh, that's the, you know the, 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 probably the best way is just an email. Email, okay. I have, to have a podcast or not a podcast. I still technically have it's a blog. Um, it started oh. out very crafty, like Pinterest crafts was really big when Jackson was a baby and. That's what I would do. So I started this like crafting blog, but then it turned into me talking more about homeschooling and curriculum and, you know, just little ideas here and there. Um, the blog's name is super long, probably should have rebranded that at some point. But... Well, we'll put a, we can put a link. You can say the name, but we can, if you send us the link, we'll add it's it to the show. It's kind of funny too, because you most of the time worked at home, Yeah. but I called it wait till your father gets home. <laughs> um, but like he was there most of the time. So it wasn't like he was coming home from work, but in my mind, that's, that's where it came from. Cause initially he was working out of the house, but there is some stuff on there and it's, I mean, it's all applicable to today too. It's just, I haven't really written on it in a long time, but it's there. All right. All right. Well, listen, we are so grateful that we, you know, got to share some time with you guys and hear your side of the, the Bitcoin homeschooling experience and looking forward to um, many more conversations. There's a there's a lot of things going on, so yeah, a lot of good things. So yeah, I, thank you for having us on your platform and on your new show. I mean, it's it's been it's been a real treat. I've uh, loved this conversation, this dynamic of having all four of us this time. Uh, and um, yeah, many more conversations. Uh, please feel free to reach out anytime. Love it. All right. Well, thank you guys, and uh, keep up the good work. It was really nice meeting you, Meredith. Thank you. You too. If you enjoyed this podcast and if you found this valuable, please leave a review to help others find us too. For those who prefer zapping sats, we love those too. We're on Fountain, we're on Noster, and we're on Orange Pill app. Also, I host a women's only Bitcoin podcast called Orange Hatter. And the mission of that podcast is to reach pre-coiner women. So if you know of someone in your life that you would like to introduce Bitcoin to, check it out. So Tali and I also don't have sponsors for this show. We are trying to build and run free market kids. You can check out our products at freemarketkids.com. This includes the Bitcoin mining game Hoddle Up, which is a great introduction to Bitcoin. The school edition of Hoddle Up is always available. We also have the 2024 halving edition. It's going to be super deluxe. Very excited to roll it out. It is available on presale at a 21% discount. Until next time, happy hodling. <laughs>